Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. There's even a brand new Brigadier General tier where you can get a shout out on a Commander's Quarters episode that's dedicated to you. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Commander's Quarters studio. Welcome to the show. So, Innistrad Midnight Hunt spoiler season is coming to an end, and what a spoiler season it has been. Although, actually, we still have the Commander pre-contacts that are coming out, I believe, on the 13th, so make sure you stay tuned for those. Regardless, yesterday we got some really exciting spoilers, including Teferi, who slows the sunset, because, you know, Teferi just loves watching sunsets. We also got Lear, Disciple of the Drown, which is an absolutely busted commander, which does exactly what a blue player wants to do, but then again at the same time the exact opposite of what a blue player wants to do. And yesterday we also got Vadric Astral Archmage, which yeah this is gonna be a really fun commander. He's all about power and all about casting well the biggest spells you possibly can. And speaking of really fun commanders, this morning we got yet another one with Florian Valderin Scion. Now it actually just took me a little bit to realize the full potential of a commander like this and what kind of a deck that you can build around it and just exactly how fun that deck would be. Well, okay, fun for you, maybe not all that fun for your opponents. Regardless, let's jump into this commander to talk about what it does and what kind of a deck you might want to build around it. So Florian Valderian Scion is a 3-3 vampire noble that has first strike and costs one black red. He has at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, look at the top X cards of your library where X is the total amount of life your opponents lost this turn. Exile one of those cards and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. You may play the exiled card this turn. So like I said earlier, it actually took me a little bit to kind of understand exactly what the potential of this commander is. Now I'm not trying to make excuses, but I had just looked at this commander right when I woke up and I hadn't had my coffee yet, but yeah, I've got it now. There are a lot of ways that we can consistently make opponents lose a lot of life before our post-combat main phase. Now obviously the first way to make our opponents lose life before our post-combat main phase is, well, combat. But obviously that's not always the most consistent thing. We can't necessarily rely on always getting through with combat damage, again because opponents might have different board states or maybe we lose our creatures, etc, etc. But there are plenty of other ways that we can consistently make everyone, maybe even including ourselves, lose a ton of life before that post-combat main phase. And again, the payoff for that is actually really huge. The more life that we make our opponents lose, the deeper we dig into our deck. We pick the best card that we need for the situation that we're in, and then we can cast it until the end of the turn. I mean, technically, yes, it does say play, so if it is a land that we choose, we get the land, but most likely we're probably not going to pick one of those, but you never know. Also, do keep in mind that if you are casting that card, you do have to pay its mana cost still. So for the most part with this tech, you're going to want to save up your mana and then play your spells on your second main phase. Regardless, again, the more damage that you do, the deeper you dig, and you can dig really deep with this deck. So essentially, you can get to the point where this is kind of like a mini tutor in a way every single turn. Again, if you've got these consistent ways in play to dish out damage and make your opponents lose a ton of life, well, you get to dig further and further into your deck, and yeah, that's basically a mini tutor. You don't get to dig through your entire deck, most likely. I mean, if you did that much damage to your opponents, they'd, they'd probably be out of the game, but still. I mean, you can deal enough damage that you can dig far enough to get the exact card that you need pretty much for the exact situation that you're in, and yeah, really set yourself up to win. Or at the very least, dish out even more damage in the next turn. So yeah, once this deck gets going, it can most definitely snowball and take over a game. But to do that, again, we need to get set up with those consistent damage dealers and ways to make our opponents lose life. So 
So first up, we can most definitely utilize some low to the ground creatures like Spear Spewer, Thermal Alchemist, and Shepherd of Rot. Spear Spear can tap and it deals 1 damage to each player. So by just getting this 1 mana creature down, every single turn we can dish out 1 damage to every player, and again that's 3 total damage to our opponents. So again for 1 mana, we're digging 3 deeper every single time with our commander. And then Thermal Alchemist can help us even more, it taps to deal 1 damage to each opponent so it's not even pinging us, and on top of that, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you untap it. So obviously the more instants and sorceries that you cast, the more damage that you're gonna be dishing out, and again, just to your opponents. Though, always keep in mind that you do want to save up mana for your post-combat main phase. But another low of the ground creature that can dish out more and more damage throughout the game is Shepherd of Rot. It can tap, and each player is gonna lose 1 life for each zombie on the battlefield. So keep in mind that this counts everyone's zombies, not just your own. So if your friend's got a zombie tribal deck, well, everyone's going to be in for a big surprise when they start losing a ton of life because of your zombie. And if you've got any other zombies out in this deck, obviously those are going to add up as well. Next up, we also have some somewhat low to the ground enchantments that can help us out too with Sanctum of Stone Fangs, Retreat to Hagra, and Ill-Gotten Inheritance. Sanctum of Stone Fang says at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life for X the number of shrines you control. Obviously, this card is a shrine and it's probably the only one that you're actually going to run, but still, one life for each opponent and you're going to gain a life each turn. And then Retreat to Hagra is going to make each opponent lose one life and us gain one life whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control. Or I guess there is also the option to give a creature we control plus one plus zero in death touch, which might apply in some circumstances, but most of the time we're going to be draining opponents. And speaking of draining opponents, how about Ill-Gotten Inheritance? It says at the beginning of our upkeep, it's going to deal 1 damage to each opponent, and we gain 1 life, and if we need to, we can sack it for extra damage. So if an opponent's really low, this can actually be the finishing blow. But of course, we've also got some bigger effects that can really drain opponents, and can help us dig really deep into our deck. First up, Tectonic Giant says, when it attacks or becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, choose 1. And the one that we're most likely going to choose pretty much all the time is it's going to deal 3 damage to each opponent. So this one creature on every single attack, or whenever it's the target of a spell or ability, is going to be dishing out 9 total damage to our opponents. Yeah, that's really going to help us dig through our deck a ton. Next up, of course our good pal Gary can help us out as well. Grey Merchant of Asphodel, better known as Gary, has when it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses X life for execute devotion to black, you gain life and go life loss this way. So this can drain our opponents for a ton and gain us a lot of life. And speaking of draining our opponents for a ton, well, also, this drains us for a ton too, but it's gonna be worth it. Dire Fleet Ravager has, when it enters the battlefield, each player loses a third of their life rounded up. So, yeah, this can really help us dig through our deck. Again, cards like Gary and Dire Fleet Ravager are more effective later on in the game when we have more mana at our disposal. And speaking of more mana, let's talk about Neheb the Eternal. Now, unfortunately, this is a $15 or so card, so yeah, not exactly budget, but still I just wanted to bring it up because obviously it'd be fantastic with this commander. It has at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, add red to your mana pool for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. So yeah, that's going to give you an absurd amount of mana in a deck like this. So you can just drain your opponents for a ton and then dig through your deck at the exact card that you need and obviously cast that with whatever mana you get with this. A and then have obviously mana left over to cast a lot of other things too, I'm sure. Regardless, we also have some bigger enchantments that can help us out as well, like Court of Ire and Dictator of the Twin Gods. Court of Ire has, when it enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. And at the beginning of your upkeep, Court of Ire is going to deal 2 damage to any target, but if you're the Monarch, it deals 7 damage to that player permanent instead. Now, an extra 2 damage to a player is nice, but yeah, 7 damage? Well, we're going to want to work to save the Monarch if we can. And then Dictate the Twin Gods has Flash, and it says if a source would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. So yeah, a damage doubler like this can be very impactful, but you've got to be careful with it because obviously this is an effect that applies to everything, including your opponent's things too. But yeah, doubling up all your damage dealing can definitely help you dig further and further into your deck. But we can also really make use of a card like Psyonic Resonator in this deck. In SP2 and Tampet, copy target triggered ability you control, you may choose new targets for the copy. Obviously, I've already mentioned a lot of triggered abilities, including damage dealing abilities and life loss abilities too. But of course, on top of that, this can double up our commander's trigger. So instead of just getting one card from our commander, we're going to be getting two. And yeah, that can be game ending. 
And speaking of game ending, of course, we can utilize cards like Rakdos Charm, Price of Progress, and as always, Exsanguinate, though that is still a decently expensive card. I think it's around eight or nine bucks at this point. Rakdos Charm is a very flexible card. It says choose one, exile cards from target player's graveyard, destroy target artifact, or each creature deals one damage to its controller. So if you're playing against, you know, a token deck, well, they're going to have a bad time with this card, especially if you've got a damage doubler or two in play. Speaking of that, if you're playing against a deck that utilizes a lot of non-basics, well, Price of Progress is going to deal damage to each player equal to twice the number of non-basic lands they control. And also keep in mind that these cards only cost two mana each. So you can easily cast these in your pre-combat main phase, dish out a ton of damage to your opponents, and dig even further in your deck. And then, of course, Exsanguinate says each opponent loses X life, you gain life, you leave life lost this way. Basically, drain your opponents for a ton, gain a lot of life. Pretty straightforward. But now that we've talked about cards that would work great with Florian, let's talk about what other decks might want Florian in the 99. First up, how about Obosh the Prey Piercer? Obosh has, if a source you control with an odd converted mana cost would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. So yeah, double up a lot of damage in a deck like this and dig even further with Florian. And speaking of damage, let's talk about Rakdos Lord of Riots, which loves when you dish out damage to your opponents. It has creature spells you cast cost one last for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. So Rakdos decks are definitely incentivized to dish out a ton of damage to your opponents, and Florian helps incentivize them further. And then next up, we've got Mogus, God of Slaughter. Many Mogus decks are also built in a group slug type strategy, and unfortunately, Mogus's trigger isn't actually going to help you with Florian, but still, there's going to be plenty of effects in that deck that can actually dish out damage and help you dig further in your deck. And one final commander that might want to consider this is Prosper Tomebound. Prosper has, whenever you play a card from Exile, create a treasure token. Again, the card that Florian gives you access to is going to be from Exile, so if you've got enough ways to dish out damage to your opponents in a deck like this, it might be worth it because you're always going to be getting a treasure from that. Regardless, it's time for me to wrap things up and give you my final thoughts on Florian Valder and Scion. In my opinion, this is definitely a really cool design for a commander, and you can do a lot of really awesome things with it. Get out more and more sources to dish out more and more damage consistently to your opponents, and dig through your deck further and further. So you can get more awesome things that dish out even more damage, and you see where this is going. Yeah, again, this commander can essentially become like a mini tutor that can get you the exact card that you need for the situation that you're in. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn to hear from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one.